question. Um, it might be interesting to come back to the uh, uh, concept of permanent, uh, deflected permanent revolution, and uh, to see, like, compare, like, the, the similarities to the similarities and differences with the situation in the past. Basically, analyze the risk of another deflected permanent revolution. I feel like because. I don't know, I study this, so this is like the main debate in my classes all the time. But it feels that there's some sense of Orientalism in the way that we view the movement, that like people are viewing in the West, are viewing the movement in the Middle East, as in like even people that come from backgrounds of, you know, working class, you know, ideologies, they think, you know, but it, it has its limitations, you know, not everybody, you know, how like, we take the factory, we take on the state, like that the people actually are pursuing uh, bigger changes. You know, there's that sense of, you know, actually they'll just get that and they'll be satisfied and then there's more issues to be dealt with and you know, actually looking at it, as, at it as a proper like the working class actually rising and, and, and fighting. Um, so I always feel in the debate there's a little bit of sense of orientalism about it, so I don't wonder what you thought about it. It's not that very interesting question. I, mean, I think it's, it, it's all quite contradictory, though, isn't it? I don't, yeah, there's, a, there's, there's this uh, argument around that people from the Arab countries, in particular, people in particular from countries in which Islam is a dominant culture, can somehow never engage in effective mass collective activity. And it's always going to be backwards, it's always going to result in the, the fundamentalists coming to the centre of the stage, and there's that going on all the time. And there was a very interesting report from an American research institute called the Hudson Institute, which was published in the summer, just after the big day of Islamist demonstrations, and they were beside themselves with happiness, yeah. because the Islamists had come onto the street and they'd say, Dad, we told you so, and here they are. And the fact that they virtually disappeared from the public space since there hasn't been commented on. But it's a contradiction, isn't it? Because, there, as you say, there is this current. On the other hand, the city of London, Chicago, Denver, Paris, Berlin, you know, you, you go, there's that sign opposite St Paul's, Tahrir Square, London, mm. EC1, whatever it is. I mean, inspiration. So it's very contradictory, isn't it? Because it's, it's almost as if, because of the scale of the world crisis, there's certainly a, a generation around, a younger generation, for whom that orientalist stuff maybe doesn't work quite so effectively, and people are eager to learn. And just final point on this: I mean, yeah. if you go to Tahrir now, I mean, if you go to Midan Tahrir, Cairo, you know, it really is a serious destination point, not for people who are just tourists. Maybe they'll go to the pyramids, but it's a serious destination point for radicals from around the world who actually, you know, go to learn. And uh, so I think there's that other side of the coin. Yeah. yeah, just responding to that quickly. Well, I think that you're right to some extent, and I really hear that a lot, like this is a question of Islamism, and blah, all these cliches. But I think another factor which we shouldn't underestimate is that people just, especially like young people, have forgotten about the history of working class struggle or don't even know about it at all. And, and that's, I think, another important aspect why they cannot really see them that as a real solution because I don't know it here, why should they know it in Egypt? And um, they perceive uh, Tahrir Square largely like as a like political demonstration and not like something with socio connected to socio-economic demands. But then of course it's something that will hopefully change in the near future. Um, I wanted to add something on, on this question because Simon mentioned a bit about the question of the doctors and the middle class. Um, Sort of, or elements of the middle class. One of the things that's particularly fascinating about the Egyptian revolution at the moment is how this model of strike action and model, in fact, of independent union organising and so on has spread out from the kind of core sections of the what's historically been in, in, in Egypt, the core of the Egyptian working class as kind of a big public sector enterprises from Mahalo, or from the bus workers and, you know, and so on, uh, right up into sections of, of Egyptian society who no more, any more than here, would normally think of themselves as trade unionists or people going on strike, like doctors. So one of the groups in, in Egypt which has been 
the most militant and has the most successful examples of um, one of the most successful examples of kind of national coordinated strike action have been doctors. And this is really important for two reasons. One of which is because it has driven a model of, again, collective action and organisation into large parts of the health service and has helped to um, spur on the development of general hospital unions in a lot of places. One of the, one of the, hospital, that, the hospital that Simon mentioned where they um, elected a new director, I was there a couple of days ago meeting with the union president and some of his colleagues. And you can, um, you can really see how that, what you know, the the sense that people have made huge gains inside the workplace against the management, against the bosses, is still there, even if it's still quite a contradictory process. And there have been sort of ebbs and flows in that particular hospital in terms of the level of activism and and so on. But one of the most important gains around the doctors' strikes has actually been. Um, very visible in the elections for the doctors' union, which is like the equivalent of the British Medical Association here, um, where which has been some uh, really run by the Muslim Brotherhood for more than a generation. They've just done extremely badly in the elections for the doctors' union, losing control of the union committees in Cairo and Alexandria, losing quite a number of seats on the national executive um, to a, a list that was run um, by basically left-wing secular activists, but not on a secularist versus Islamist kind of ticket, not at all. These are the people who ran and organised and led the doctor's strikes of earlier this year, and they have pulled with them large sections of the Brotherhood's own base who voted for them. Um, and that this is incredibly important confirmation that the social struggle is the thing that increases the contradictions within Islamist movements, and it provides a model, of, a different model of how you can organise to to change and win your, your rights, which is attractive to people, and helps to break down some of, firstly, the, the kind of Orientalist image of, you know, that surely these people can't possibly be won by any of these ideas. They will all revert to some kind of backward uh, Islamist perspective eventually. Um, and I think, you know, these kind of, ex these kind of experiences, it's really important that people know about them, because that's not... The, the message that's going to be come across in the mainstream media, particularly in the wake of the election results in Tunisia, they will return back to a trajectory of simply focusing on, um, you know, on this narrative of Islamism and, and, and bringing up all the Islamophobic kind of analysis that has dominated reporting in the Middle East for so long. Um, would like the struggle keep going and we see that there's increase of strikes that you know happening every day we hear about more and more strikes but no real solutions in a sense because there's not there's not a system that can actually like reply to it in a way so like we're making demands of you know changing the regime but it seems that it's like kind of on a hold uh, less from what I understand of, of actual like taking people off uh, and changing it, and how do you think ideas of like moral economy will emerge again with you know the, the consistent of, of strikes keep going? When will people reach? Will they reach a point of saying, okay, now we need to start thinking about building, you know, the country again, and, and, and what is happening now, and, and, and the risk of that happening? I'm, I'm not saying that that will necessarily happen, but what's the risk of that kind of emerging again? Uh, thank you very much, Simon. Well, first, you, you didn't refer to Tunisia at all. I was, yeah, I was going to ask the question of Tunisia. Uh, the IMF and World Bank, they claimed, sorry, they claimed that uh, when you look at uh, income inequality and this is, Tunisia uh, is a good uh, example of the successful policies uh, by and uh, IMF, etc. Uh, and you didn't mention to, to me that uh, I was going to ask you, uh, you agreed them on these statistics? Uh, wasn't there any important class element in the Tunisian revolution? 
Apart from the fact that you can uh, mention Tunisia, and actually Tunisia had a wave of strikes as well. I mean, it was very similar in a smaller scale to Egypt in terms of the combination or synthesis of mass movement and, and uh, workers' movement. Apart from that, uh, the question is, I mean, it just reminds me of the com configuration or topology of the classes you're talking. I mean, it just reminds me of uh, uh, the Prophet and Proletariat, uh, what Chris Harman wrote in like 93. Okay, we are dealing with all these different factions, we are dealing with like uh, doctors, I thought that the educated elite middle classes, we are dealing with the petty bourgeoisie, we are dealing with the factions of working class. That's fine. I mean, and as interesting actually what uh, Chris is talking about uh, pamphlet, the sections of society which were going which were attracted to Islamism because Islamism was the only form of perverse or kind of pseudo-radical uh, ra radical rhetoric available at the time. Now we have, I mean, they can go any direction. Actually, it's the other way around. I mean, okay, there's a 20 year, I mean, a 16 years history between 94 and now, uh, and Islamism has lost some of its credibility. I mean, again, in that pamphlet, which I everyone should read, uh, um, Chris talks about how, whenever um, the major part of the Islamists go more central, go more conservative, and try to be be part of the state, then there's always factionalization. The more radical elements go and become like other terrorist cells or become like, more radical cells. Uh, put this one aside. It's going to be another kind of uh, conflict, the tension, in addition to what we are having in like European countries or even say 19th century uh, examples that Marx was using. And what is because a section of middle class or, or educated elite in Middle East, whether it's Arab countries or Iran. They see themselves as part and parcel of this project of modernization. And also they come head to head with anything in relation to religion. Yeah? Not only how with Islamism, but anything. That's why and, and that's one of the problems because they their version of the left of Marxism has always been very anti-Islamic, rather than being either indifferent to Islam or kind of having it not as a priority. I mean, you have Marxists whose main priority was secularism, or even more like atheism before being material class politics. Yeah? My, my question is, what's happening in relation to that? And second question is, we talk about workers, that's true. What's the relationship between workers and the reminiscent of, of the traditional left, for example, say in Egypt, yeah? Are the, these workers spontaneous self-organized or not? I mean, this is something which goes back to the tradition, all old tradition of post nasserite or even pre nasserite uh, left and some people who have a form of rhetoric. And what happens to them? I mean, are they important, are they existent, or is it just a new from the uprising themselves. Yeah, let me come back in a few things. Yeah, so I forgot Tunisia, I also forgot Bahrain, apologies. I, I, did, I, I spotted them as I was going through. Um, the, 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 thing about, the thing about Tunisia, because it was the first one to go and it seemed quite, quite, quite sharp, I mean, there was the, the, the mass demonstrations, the confrontation of the state, and then there was a general strike. Uh, but there is an official union and so on, so it wasn't quite as pure or spontaneous that, uh, that you had inside of Egypt. Um, uh, and the fragility, I think, of Ben Ali's regime actually meant that he went r r much quicker. Um, it was, I think, the, 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 the element of it, I think. To be honest with you, when the Tunisian revolution broke out, I didn't pay that much attention. Because it was like, you know, Tunisia, who cares about Tunisia? And, you know, you, you think of the central parts of the Arab world, you know, Palestine and Iraq and so on. So when the Tunisian thing started, it was like, oh, that's the Tunisians. Oh, what are the Tunisians up to? And so on. And it was, if, if you like, but it had, in a, in, in a same kind of way, in a smaller kind of way, the same, uh, the, the same elements of the mass demonstrations and then, the, uh, and then the strikes. And I think what's interesting about, about Tunisia is, is what's happened since. Uh, has been the way in which the, 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 the new regime, if you like, has been able to, to, to attempt to, 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 to stabilize it. And it's thrown up quite interesting questions. So, so you had the victory of the Islamists, or the moderate Islamists, however you want to call it, the kind of Turkish model. It, 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 it isn't this, but what are their policies? I think this is, this is the thing people need to look at. It is a continuation of the neoliberalism that they had before. And so you have, if you like, the first vote that went towards the Islamists. They were the, the, the main opposition, the ones that attracted so much support, the, the, the ones with, with, uh, uh, with some kind of profile. And yet, what's going to happen now, really, I think it's going to be the really interesting question, that is, is that if they continue with the neoliberalism, with the privatizations, which they are planning to do, and actually that, that will throw up once again the, the kind of sharp, uh, the sharp uh, 
contradictions. What's really the, the other thing about Bahrain, um, which, is, which is interesting, which is that they went through a similar thing, and there was a call for a general strike. It was led by the teachers' union, the head of the teachers' union. There was a call for a general strike, and then the day before, a couple of days before, it was called off. They were draw, drawn into negotiations with the regime. They called off the general strike, and suddenly the, 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 uprising, the, the uprising stumbled. Now, whether this was an important moment or not, with you know, tens and tens of Saudi tanks driving, uh, uh, driving into to, to suppress the uprising is a different question. But you did still see that same element of it, um, that, that same element of it going through. I think the stuff about the Orientalism is really interesting because you see it in, in different ways. The one most, the thing I really see it is, has been amongst the Tunisians, especially the Tunisians who seem to be influenced a, a lot by, by the French left, kind of absolutely devastated, almost completely devastated by, by you know, this is the end of the revolution. I think one person said, this is like Iran. You know, that, 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 that if you like, the main danger constantly is the Islamists. The main model is Iran. So what's going to happen now, that hope we had that this was going to be some kind of secular revolution, so <coughs> actually it means that it's going to end up like, uh, like Iran. Kind of failing to understand, if you like, failing to look at, a, a, the contradictions of Islamist organizations, but also the, natures of the, the nature of, of the revolution itself. And you see this specifically with Libya. Right after the fall of, the, of, 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 of Gaddafi's regime, the whole language around Libya changed, especially in the US press. It was no longer, they didn't no longer talk about rebels and regime forces. They talked about secular forces and the Islamists. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, this is, the, this is what, and who are the secular forces? Well, it's the Transitional National Council, who are friendly to NATO, the old uh, ex, uh, a lot of them former members of the regime themselves, put back in the, in the old positions and so on. And they said, these are the good guys, these are secular. And then there's the new bad guys, the Islamists. And of course, the head of the military council in Tripoli is an Islamist. So is the head of the, the, the military council in Benghazi, Al-Baida, and just about every other, every other city. And, if you, and you see really how, well, actually, the real question here is, is whether the revolution in Libya can find its feet again, whether it can re-emerge. begin to see a certain extent of it re-emerging, and the, the way in which it's re-emerging, and the way in which uh, uh, the, so the oil worker strike, which I think is really significant, but also the way in which large sections of the country are refusing to take orders from the Transitional National Council, and the way in which then this is put as, these are the Islamists, these are the backward people trying to attempt to hijack the revolution. What, what we need is, is a continuation of all the policies that, that, that went before. So that whole argument about secular versus Islamism, I think, covers very much a, 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 a whole series of, a whole number of sins. That doesn't mean it isn't important. Because in Lebanon, the question of the secular is extremely important. And the reason why it's important is, is because there are there's so many uh, minorities without any one being bigger than any of the others, that actually you have a, a, a very structured sectarian regime, and so the general demand is to replace it with a secular regime, which I think is, is posed in its historical context, and its concrete historical context, in a different way than it is posed, uh, 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 is posed uh, uh, every, everywhere else. Uh, just on the question of why the Syrian working class ha haven't moved, now, there, there are several reasons. Most, most Syrians you talk to say the reason for this is, is, is simply the, the level of repression, but I don't think that's enough. I don't think it's enough to, to, to explain it. There is that process of kind of neoliberalism in Fitah, the opening up of the economies and so on that's taking place in the rest of the Arab world has only just really begun in Syria. So there were some elements of it, but actually the vast majority of Syrians are still employed by the state. And so for the, when, when I was having a, a, a discussion with, with a Syrian revolutionary, part, part of the opposition, and, I, I, and, and so trying to tackle this question of why they haven't moved in Aleppo, uh, in, in large sections of Damascus. What's really interesting has been the demands and the strategy of the revolution are completely different to everywhere else. They, they talk about winning over the bourgeoisie of Aleppo and Damascus, not winning over the working class. And the reason why this is important is because actually, for if you are, uh, and I had this one from, from one Syrian who said, we're very worried for what will happen, you know, we support the revolution, we're really worried what happened to us, what happened to Poland. That is, you had the, the kind of overthrow of, of the state, the overthrow of the state capitalist system, followed by massive neoliberalism and the destruction of the economy. And so a lot of them actually still have that worry that the, the, that, that, that the revolution will simply open up, if you like, uh, even further uh, uh, new, new, new liberalism. And also, because I think uh, another aspect of this is that there needs to be some kind of political breakthrough. 
once there is a political breakthrough, I think, inside the revolution, then you begin to see how you can begin to see the d development of, uh, of, 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 of working class struggle. But it is the main problem of the Syrian uh, re revolution that it hasn't been able to go. When you think of Aleppo, it is the biggest city in that area. It's the biggest city in, in the whole of the Near East, if you like. And so it is, it is crucial what happens there. And it hasn't shifted. It hasn't moved. And simply making appeals to the bourgeoisie of Aleppo, sometimes actually taking on sectarian terms. Bourgeoisie is mainly Sunni. The cities of Dara and Hams and Hamma, these are mainly Sunni. So therefore, they should need to come because they're Sunnis. And actually, it's not working that way. Because actually, sectarianism doesn't work that way uh, at all. So, so there, if you like, there is political, a lack of political development to a certain extent. I think you know, elements of this will begin to change. It will begin to change. There's a second element of that, which is that unlike the kind of rhetoric of, of Libya and, and a lot of the Arab regimes, the Syrian regime has delivered to a certain extent the support of Hamas and Hezbollah. So there is large sections of the, uh, of, uh, of, of, the, of, of the working class, of the revolutionary left, the Communist Party and so on, I said the revolutionary left, the Communist Party and sections of the left who actually have gone with the regime. Hezbollah went with the regime. Um, even Samir Kantar, who was the, the, the prisoner, mm. the Trotskyist, who was in prison for years inside of, of, of Israel, was released a couple of years ago. Darpa made a speech in which he denounced the Syrian revolution and the Libyan revolution as being agents of the West and so on. So there is <laughs> much more, uh, much more, much more uh, confusion. I mean, e even to come out onto the streets, and to come out onto the streets for the Egyptian revolution in Beirut was simple. It was really easy. No one, no one challenged you. Actually, to come out in the streets of Beirut to support the Syrian revolution is extraordinarily dangerous, and our comrades have discovered. You know, you get beaten quite badly, and you will, uh, the chance of, of getting killed. So there is, if you like, that element of it, in which says that the, the Syria regime is a good regime, even though it's made mistakes, it's shot children and all that kind of thing. These are all mistakes. But actually, at, at its base, the, 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 regime is, uh, the, the, the regime is safe. I think, having said we shouldn't compare these things to Iran, I think probably Syria is one we can compare to Iran. Because if you think of the beginning, you know, the Iranian revolution just break out one day in 1979, there was a period of mass demonstrations, confrontations that took place, I think, over a period of two years. And you can see this process taking place in Syria, uh, in, Syria's, uh, in Syria's, uh, uh, as well. I think we have to remember, because I mean, it's, it's not an SWP cliche now, isn't it? The revolution is a process. It's not just one event. It's a whole series of events. Actually, it's a whole series of crises inside of uh, <coughs> inside a revolution. The creation of counter-revolutionary forces. The, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the, the development of the, of the working class, the development of the organizations of the working class, all these things take place inside this moment of, of revolution, in which there are peaks and troughs, in which there are e e e ebbs and flows, and in which insurrection is simply one element of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of the revolution. Um, just again to the question, so I'll, I'll just finish the this bit, just on the question of the um, of, of the deflected Poland revolution, actually it was, it was a question that came up in my head, funny enough, today. I was thinking, can, can you imagine the situation where there would be a repeat of, of, of the 1950s? I think what, what we have to remember about that was that the, that period of the 1940s and 1950s where the working class wasn't able enough to go, wasn't able to lift itself enough to go that, to, to make the revolution permanent with the colonialism and the, and the power of imperialism actually then opened up the space for <coughs> another group to come through. Whether these conditions exist for another form of deflect, deflected permanent revolution, I'm not so sure. And don't, don't quote me on it. I'm not so sure. I think the bigger danger is counter-revolution and the, and, and, the, and, and the gathering of the counter-revolutionary forces. Because, because again, you know, we were talking about sort of not just different eras, but different, almost different social conditions uh, than 1950s and 1960s than we are talking about today. And we're talking about not a submissive bourgeoisie, a bourgeoisie attempting to find its feet, but actually a bourgeoisie, I think, that's quite integrated into the global, uh, glo global uh, capitalist system. I mean, one of the points of these discussions is, is to allow us I mean, to explore all sorts of ideas in ways which we sometimes can't get, you know, more uh, Typically, done with the socialist working party branch meetings and so on. So, we can hopefully indulge ourselves a bit in form of speculation. And on the question of permanent revolution, which you raised, very important, a uh, uh, deflected permanent revolution, very, very important question. Um, I mean, Simon is talking about different phases, different eras, epochs. The 1950s and 1960s, the system was expanding, the world system was expanding. 
uh, sort of the people like the uh, Nasas of Gaddafi and so on, found themselves leading these newly independent states, um, were, were able to pursue development <coughs> agendas, which provided didn't they, some of the basics that the anti-colonial movements had, had demanded. Some of the welfare reforms, the commitments to full employment, and so on. We are, we are not in that situation for reasons we, we all appreciate. And I, I think sometimes was right. The danger in Egypt is more counter-revolution. I mean, deflection from the revolution is counter-revolution. But a classic counter-revolution is much more likely. But in the case of Egypt, the pressures on the mass of the people are so intense that, uh, and at the same time, it's not possible for the for a, a Nasser to come to power and say, turn on the tap, here's, well, here's a land reform, you know, here's full employment. Everyone who gets degrees assured of a job, it's just not possible. In fact, on the contrary, if you read all the Egyptian papers, every day they say, unless we can get another, you know, whatever it is, $10 billion from the IMF and the World Bank, we're scuppered by, this, you know, by the new year. But the other thing, I just wanted to... to link two other things together. Um, this one thing about revolutions being a process. I mean, you could argue that the Egyptian revolution started 10 years ago. And you could argue that after 30 or 40 years of relentless repression under Sadat and Mubarak, in 2000, with the movement of solidarity with the Intifada, and then later on, all different phases of the democracy movement, and then the workers' movement, the revolution has been in process for some time. And that, in a sense, Egyptian workers came to the centre of the stage in 2004, or if you, if you like it, maybe a little bit later, depending on you know, where you're measuring these big strikes from. So when one says, well, why haven't the workers done it in Syria? Well, they only started in 2011. I mean, uh, you know, the, there are these processes, and clearly what's happening in Syria is absolutely profound. Um, and has affected the consciousness of every adult Syrian in one way or another. Now, how that um, is expressed in terms of collective activities remains to be seen, but I don't think, because we're looking at the Egyptian workers in 2011, the Syrians haven't reached that point of struggle, it means that somehow that the Syrian revolution is stalled or is, uh, you know, what's the word, uh, you know, it's... Uh, is, is not going to progress to full fruition. And then there's a question of history. I just want to put on the agenda, if I could, the, the, the question of, of history. Because it, the, you could argue, I think, that what we've seen in the last 10 years is the return to uh, the political stage of uh, the Arab working class and the resumption of struggles which began in the first two decades of the 20th century in Egypt certainly peaked in the period after the First World War, time so matured all the way through the 1920s and 30s and 40s as the anti-colonial movement built, continued into the 1950s, uh, continued in the Gulf, in Iraq in particular in the 50s into the 1960s. The Iraqi revolution was an immensely important event in the, in the late 1950s. And it's really not until the 60s that the energies of the workers of the region are type of dissipated in various ways. And then for the last 30 or 40 years, things have been a lot quieter. Now you could say that struggle's resumed. I think it's a very strong case for saying that struggle's resumed. So what intervened to suppress that struggle? And although we're going to be discussing this in more detail in a couple of weeks, I think you have to introduce into the scene the Arab nationalist movement and the Stalinist tradition. You know, if you take the, the Iraqi revolution, I mean, the events of the Iraqi Revolution were as important as anything else which happened in the global south in the 1950s or early 1960s. And the Iraqi Communist Party was certainly, I think, wasn't it at the time, and the most significant mass movement of its type, certainly in the, in the, in the Middle East, possibly, possibly worldwide, in terms of its actual scale of membership and so on, and implantation. Into the Indian, 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 and they played worse as well. Okay, yeah. sorry. Indonesia. Yeah. So just to bring this point to yeah, just to bring this point to a market conclusion <coughs> that the intervention of Arab nationalists, the deflected permanent revolution, the role of the communist parties in suppressing, subordinating the interests of the masses in the region, the interests of that time in the Soviet Union, very very important. Plus one other thing that we haven't mentioned so far, 
uh, and that is also the appearance on the scene of Israel. Now, we, what was the cluster of factors which led this movement, very powerful workers' movement, around since the twenties, rising, key part of the anti-colonial movement, a number of significant revolutionary moments, particularly in Egypt and Iraq. So, what happens? The fifties, the sixties, the seventies, the Arab nationalists, and the, and the and the old communists, the Stalinists, and also the state of Israel, the emergence of the Palestine question providing, if you like, the alibi for the nationalists to suppress and subordinate the struggles of people in their own interest to a fictitious struggle of Arab nationalism against Israel, because it's a struggle that was always derailed and very suppressed in various ways. So, I mean, there's some really interesting points to try and discuss and draw out over the next couple of weeks. So, we'll start from the end of what it is. I do disagree with you on the question of Palestine because I think Palestine was, uh, okay, philosophy you can say, like an empty signifier that many things can be attached to it, like a container. First, as you said, nationalists came and used it as their main cause. Then you have, I mean, then you have come to the Islamists for the last 20 years. Yeah? That Palestine became the main rallying point for many Islamic, uh, for Islamist countries across the uh, region and like one of the main causes of a founding cause of the Iranian regime after the defeat of the revolution. That's why I, mean, I think of Palestine itself didn't necessarily have one specific meaning here, yeah? because they managed to interpret and reinterpret it at a different point. I mean, I think that was the defeat of the left, not being able to translate the question of Palestine to an anti-imperialism. And they did, I mean, for 60s and 70s, to some extent, they managed to give that interpretation to it. That's why it wasn't only nationalism, the fact that nationalists managed to win because they, they, they battled over the interpretation of the problem of Palestine over other sections for a while, and then they lost it themselves to the country. Islam is another thing. Uh, but what, what, one thing I'm being inspired by what Phil said about the general thing. Uh, in, in your talk, Simon, you basically kind of have this uh, question of you will not, will not have the beginning of a revolutionary process unless we, or at least a significant victory in the revolutionary process unless we have both factors. One, the mass insurrectory demonstrations, the other one is, is the kind of wave of the strikes. And it's completely true. I think one of the main reasons that for example, Iran's green movement didn't go any further was didn't manage to, one, bring up workers in, uh, in terms of a strike. Second, didn't manage to translate its political demands into economic demands and back from economic to political. Produce having this dialectical process, yeah? Because as, as kind of famously, I mean, you, you, you talked about it in months of 2006, Mahalla, but of Sahir Asif Bayat kind of famously has in his book the, the list of the, the list of demands of like oil workers in 1978, uh, September 81, goes from a very local, very kind of very uh, specific demands about. <clears throat> Uh, communication should be in Persian, and then kind of more of some increase in salary, etc. And the third one is free over political prisoners, yeah? and the fourth is just on the whole kind of national thing. So they just move really quickly from one to another one. But in that case, I want to I think, is it correct to talk about Arab revolutions in one go? Because as you know, both the, the structure of the infrastructure for working classes. Named, I mean, i.e., the trade unions have different traditions in these countries. Tunisia and Egypt are kind of slightly luckier ones in terms of having reminiscent of some uh, old trade unions. Libya, they had less, it's been much more repression. You go to Morocco, it's a different situation. Jordan is a different situation. Don't we have to like discuss them individually? Second thing is, it is true that the hardening of working classes condition of life in the last 20 years because of the because of IMF, IMF and uh, WTO dictating their policies has affected these countries. But it's been other factors as well, like Saudi has always helped some of these countries in order to reduce the possibility of uprising, help with subsidizing something, come helping. Same as how America, America helped Egypt to some extent, not massively, but like $2 billion a year, now it's gone to eight, etc. But but the question is like in Libya we didn't have that because you have oil revenue. I mean, Gaddafi was not, uh, it was a different situation. So it shouldn't be like go and singularly and particularly discuss the specific economies because with Egypt and Libya, Libya and Syria, completely different situations. Yeah. I, would, um, I would like to come back on the point of the um, secular movements and uh, versus like the Islamic movements and 
particular the Arab left, because that's something that I always find really complicated. And especially in Palestine, I was always really annoyed by the sectarianism of the PFP people, like the, how they talked about Islam. And um, I, what I found really amazing, actually, in, in, in Egypt, and that's just a personal uh, impression, was that the way the left dealt with uh, uh, Islam and how open they were also towards uh, Christianity, of course, like, Maybe because there was just no other way, because like everyone is religious there, so it's like you can't just say like I don't believe in God. But um, for example, I've been speaking to uh, one of the people from the Communist Party in Mahala, and, and actually the most interesting part of the debate was about like how we deal with Islam or with religion in general. And he was very open-minded on that. He was a Stalinist. I mean, he was very like. Maybe that's because. <laughs> Anyhow, it was very like we have to find a way to present ourselves like uh, and, um, as open to religion and not anti-religious. And uh, also, like for example, the um, the um, Workers' Party, like um, Kamal Khalil, um, the, they have lots of com comrades that are selling papers and wearing a headscarf. So that's a really good sign. And like our comrades uh, have the symbol with the with the. Um, Crescent and, and the cross, which is really like showing that they're open. So I, that's maybe like a shows the way for like how the left should deal with religion and not be like too sectarian. And then a short question on Tunisia: like how do we analyze the elections, or what do you think of the elections, and what is the way forward? Because there have been some riots. And will it be like will it go on, or will people like just stay at home now? Um, I wanted to come in with some comments on um, some of the things that have been raised and um, I think that to start with Phil's last point about the impact of the of the Nakba, actually I, I agree I think that if you look at the specific the cycle of protest that in the 1940s 1948 is particularly striking in this respect, January 1948 you have mass ups, uprising in Iraq uh, which cancels the Treaty of Portsmouth. There's a huge popular uprising, forces the British-backed monarchy to, to cancel the treaty it's just signed with Britain, which was to extend British control of Iraq for another 30 years. And this is a huge event, and it breaks up into a mass wave of strikes, very similar to Luxembourg's um, you know, descriptions that Simon was quoting. And that, what halts that and kind of turns it round is, in fact, is the Nakba, is the, is the outbreak of, of war and the Arab armies from the various different countries going in to Palestine to save it. Egypt, very similar, eight, <coughs> 19, 1948, again, there's another peak of workers' struggle. In fact, with a police strike, April 48, you have policemen marching through the streets with um, loaves of bread on, their, on the ends of their bayonets being attacked by the army. Um, you know, raising economic demands, raising national demands, and so on, and a real sense of, pri of crisis of the state. Um, not that dissimilar to last week in Cairo, where there's been a police strike um, uh, going. In fact, a national police strike by corporals, police corporals, for the last for the last week or so. Um, and again, it's like the the one of the things that 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 turns that movement into a slightly different direction and, and, and allows the state to come in, even this is before, obviously, the fall of the monarchy, to present itself as, a, um, uh, as having a, you know, a kind of radical agenda of saving Palestine is the, is the, outbreak, of the, uh, it, or is the outbreak of the war. Um, I mean, I think there's some that needs to be more, it's something that needs to be explored, explored further, the relationship then between, because it, it has a contradictory effect. It radicalises, it it radicalizes people in one direction and also takes you know it's very fundamental to the development of the of the free officers the the young officers groups who start to see themselves as uh, as needing to in, to intervene so it, it intensifies the crisis of the old regime but it also leads um, very directly to a particular trajectory of uh, of politics and that comes to the leadership of the um, of the movement in terms of the um, you know it, with the absence of the working class being able to take that leading role. Uh, on the question of the, um, uh, Asif Bayat's book on the question of uh, demands, very interesting if you look in terms of Egypt. I've been reading strikers' demands. And probably, I have a 750 strike reports of strikes since March of classified in terms of demands. So in terms, it, it, this is e in Egypt across you know, most of them, um, so, so that's kind of eight months worth of, of demands. Very, they, 
very, very few since March have actually explicitly classic political demands, one or two, really. If you're talking about things like release of political prisoners or freedom of expression, they, all have, they do have, very large numbers, have political demands in the sense of the whole process of um, getting rid of the old regime figures. And in some cases, very high, you know, very high political demands of getting rid of the minister, say, for example, the teachers' strike. One of the key demands was um, the teachers want the downfall of the minister. They want to get rid of the education minister. And these kind of things are repeated at more or less higher or lower levels of the state apparatus in strike after strike after strike. So these are, it's an intensely political process. Um, but they're, they're, in, terms of the, in terms of the kind of classic... Um, specifically political demands, those haven't, those are, are not generally being raised at the moment. Um, where I think the politics of the re recent strike wave lies, though, and I think this is incredibly important and is not very well appreciated outside of Egypt or necessarily within Egypt, is that taken in the aggregate, the demands of the, particularly the mass strikes in September, represent really a kind of, if you like, a workers' program against neoliberalism. And not merely against austerity, but actually raising demands that go fundamentally very far beyond neoliberalism. Take, for example, the demand of making workers permanent jobs. This is, this is a massively <coughs> important demand, which is, is, again, a motivating factor in, dozen, in hundreds and hundreds of strikes. And I, can, if, I will find the figures, but if anyone wants to, t I will be able to tell you exactly how many out of the ones that I've looked at. Um, but what's important about this is that this is about... A f the whole process of neoliberalism is about driving out of any sense of job security, of casualisation, of forcing people into the most miserable existence of hand-to-mouth that they can possibly manage while still managing to run the economy. Um, and in very large numbers of strikes, people have raised on mass scale and succeeded in getting tens of thousands of people being, being offered permanent jobs in order to stop some of the strikes. I mean, so, for example, the... Um, uh, industry of, of irrigation employees were had a strike a few weeks ago. They had a big sit-in, 3,000 of them outside the, the, the parliament buildings, where they demanded 55,000 um, fixed-term contract workers in the ministry should be given permanent, be given permanent jobs. Um, I mean, I, I can't remember what what percentage of them actually got it, but in the case of the teachers, again, this is. The, the, the Minister of Education, in order not to lose his job, was, was holding out the prospect of 60,000 fixed-term teachers being made, given permanent jobs. Um, the, these kind of things are, you know, are a fundamental assault on, on some of the key, the key aspects of neoliberalism. Or take the issue of the maximum wage, which is one of my favourites. A very common demand is a demand for a minimum, national minimum wage. Or, or for wages it, within a specific strike, people say we want wages to be paid at this level, which is the level that was raised by the, <coughs> the slogan raised by the Mahala workers. But in quite a number of cases, people raise the question of a maximum wage as a method of redistribution. Or if you take the question about the um, uh, nationalisation, again, six very large, six or seven very large companies have been deprivatised. They the court decision to privatise has been annulled. <coughs> I mean, including like Omar Effendi, which is a big department store, was sold off to a Saudi investor in, in a very fraudulent and um, you know in a fraudulent privatisation process, which employs thousands of people. And the point about these and the other, okay, so far fairly small number of successes is that this has all been won from below. This is about struggle from below. We take the Shabin or Com textile workers, 128 strikes since. 2006, and they have forced the state to agree that their company should be taken back off the investor. And this is causing the, the Egyptian government immense grief. They are going to be taken to court by these foreign investors. There's the, they're, they're in a panic about it because it's just, you know, it, because it is. I, I just think it's really important to, to get our heads around that this is not simply about resistance to austerity that on a mass scale the strikes are starting to point towards demands that are, are raising quite different visions of, of society. And I think this relates to the question of Syria, because again you can, see the, um, you can see how the unevenness is in the whole process of permanent revolution on a regional scale can work. But if you imagine that the Egyptian revolution took a leap forward and in, in deepened in a social direction and started to show to people 
not only could we just resist austerity, but we could go go beyond that and and start to make real social gains for ordinary people. What that message might send to people in Syria who were afraid that of going the way of Poland. You know, you could see how you could see the importance of the interaction between it on a you know on a regional level on this question, the key question around um, uh, around the social the social struggle. Um, just a quick point on, on the political demands. I think one notable exception uh, where there's like explicitly like a political uh, formulation is uh, the third call for the third intifada. And, and the way that radicalized people. I found that really interesting because I felt that for the first time people were actually like really like go, uh, that was really something that had this call had an enormous potential to radicalize people, and especially when we went like we tried to get into Gaza and people felt like okay we cannot go through because the army is stopping us and then hang on a second. I thought the army would support Palestine and would open the border and then they don't. So people were really radicalized, and when they started like shooting at us, like in the in the front of the embassy, uh, uh, they insulted people, insulted supposedly as Palestinians. And people were like, "What is it an insult to be Palestinian? Like, are you racist or what?" So they really like uh, um, realized like how, how how like the the which side the army was on. So I think that's a that's a good political. I'd like to resume the Israel thing just for a minute, if possible. So I disagree with you, Ali. And I, I think that it struck the imperialist strategists of the period during and after the First World War were prophetic. They were very far seeing. Uh, you know, when the British came up with the Balfour Declaration, they were very experienced imperial administrators. And I, I, they felt, a significant number of them felt that if they was, uh, you know, quite a Jewish homeland in Palestine, that would be congenial to British interests. When Sir Ronald Storrs, the British Governor General of Palestine, wrote in the late 1920s, what did he say? He said that different lobbies came to him. The Palestinian national leadership came to him. The Zionist leadership came to him, and they put their different arguments. And he concluded that he, he was the person who said that I became convinced that a Jewish state in Palestine could be for the British a loyal little Jewish Ulster and a sea of hostile Arabism. Remember that famous quote. He drew that conclusion. Um, and then later on the Americans tugged for their own reasons drew the same conclusion. And one aspect, not just that Israel will be located strategically in there with oil resources and strategic routes and so on, but they understood that the ideological significance in relation to the, the, the anti-colonial movement and, and the dominant, seems to me, the dominant outcome of the Zionist presence has been to uh, act as a means of uh, suppressing, subordinating, dislocating uh, key elements of the collective struggle of people in the region. By all sorts of means, I would say it's not contradictory, by all sorts of means, including the Nakba was a terrible blow for Jewish activists in the Arab states who have been absolutely critical to the development of the Communist Party, for in Egypt, for example. If you, if you read some of the biographies, autobiographies of the Egyptian Jewish communists, they said the creation of Israel was a blow from which we never recovered. And, and, the, and then, you know, in the 50s, all those people of Jewish you know, origin, Jewish identification, places like Iraq, as well as Egypt, who leave and go to Israel, and it ethnicised struggles, anti-colonial struggles, at the heart of which was the Arab working class, is, was the working class, sorry, I shouldn't say Arab work, the working class, and then ethnicised into, there's then a Jewish struggle and an Arab struggle. So I think in the historical wider sweep, the appearance on the scene of an ethnocentric movement in the middle of a region which was involved in anti-colonial, increasingly class-based upheaval was profoundly negative and exploited by self-seeking new ruling classes in the form of the, uh, the military and other professionals who took power in the Arab states. 
I was not much disagreeing. I mean, I, yeah. no, I, I agree with whatever you said, but yeah. But I'm saying that okay, you're, you're right. I mean, and yes, you said that the way it was presented, the way that kind of the, I mean, they posed the problem of Israel for the Arab world, somehow made it natural, kind of or organic, to be a matter of nationalism first and giving the upper hand to nationalists rather than other groups. You're right. I mean, mm -hmm. basically, kind of seeing the kind of uh, context in which uh, Israel becomes not. This kind of different question of imperialism took much longer, perhaps. Yeah. But what I'm saying, I mean, at the same time, I mean, it went, it has been handed over from one group to another group with their own agenda. I mean, the latest one being like Ahmadinejad, or you know, even more interestingly, more in, after Ahmadinejad, the next group which are using uh, Israel are Turkish neoliberal government or the Khan. Yeah? I mean, every everyone knows that there's a, there's a kind of credit, there's a symbolic credit there. <coughs> Has to manage to <coughs> somehow kind of appropriate that, that that problem. Yeah, but you're right. I mean, the starting point definitely was was brought to the kind of to the class struggle and turning it to the national struggle. Although the national struggles at the time were not necessary, it had much tighter relationship to anti-colonialism. Mossad, I mean, in Iran, uh, he was a nationalist, wasn't he? But at the same time, being nationalist at that time meant you are anti-colonialist. We also lost that. at the beginning. He was. Wasn't he genuinely anti communist No, sir. At the very beginning, like 53. No. He sought alliances with the Americans and the British. Yeah, okay, he was pro Palestinian. Pro -Palestinian. <laughs> but the initial Nasser's, all Nasser's initial orientation was to the West. And it's only when he couldn't get strike deals with Britain, particularly the Americans, that he lurched from West to East. And then suddenly he's an ally of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union comes in builds the dam, puts up the steelworks, and then suddenly Nasser's nationalizing uh, the major... He has been attacked by Britain and France as well in the, in, in the middle of it. This is true. But, no, there's a, there's a very sharp move from the Nasser of 1952 to the Nasser of 1956. That's right, but same as Mossad yeah. I mean, he tried to get support from America, at the same time, a year and a half, two years later, he got toppled by Syria, and cool. I mean, the fact that the elite so politics differently, and they thought they can manage to do politics through diplomatic kind of, uh, dealing with different kind of the different uh, imperialist regimes. The reminiscent of a colonial type of politics, something. But the fact that their the actions had anti-colonialist. I, I think it's just worth well, that sort of turning into dialogue. Although I think it's very, I, I, I do think it's very interesting and important for us. But I think that Nasser was an anti-imperialist. He was just a second. He was a radical. The extent that the mass movement forced him to be. You know, the, the mass movement, which we talked about earlier, growing to the 30s and 40s, is that movement which precipitates the circumstances under which the free officers come to power. And they kick what the, free, the first thing the free officers do? Land reform. Not because Nasser was committed to land reform, the masses demanded it in the first you know, week. So, and that pressure continues and continues, and Nasser has to fight the movement and suppress the movement. So I think that these, these contradictions are inherent in Nasser from the very early space. Actually, to be fair, the, the first thing that the first thing the free officers did with the mass movement was hang strikers in Kafradwa, yeah, yeah, in Kafradwa, yeah, yeah, yeah. but and that was why they did land. That yeah. was the motivation yeah. for the land reform. Um, I, I wanted. Yeah. I, I wanted to just say something in relation to the question that Ali raised. I think it's really important about the specificity of the revolutionary process in different countries because I think that is a really big question for us. I would say that um, in the case of, I mean, even if you look at Tunisia and Egypt, the, actually when you talk about, say, trade union organisation, you have very, very different experiences. You actually have, in both cases, um, I think an absolutely decisive role played by the working class. Um, but you don't. The, if, if you take the case of Tunisia, the final death blow <coughs> is struck by the UJTT, by the um, uh, by the existing trade union movement, which has an interesting relationship with the regime, with Ben Ali's regime, um, has spent some time, sometimes in opposition to it, sometimes working with it. And, uh, and my reading of what happens is that it's a process of the rank and file of the UJTT forcing its way through in, co in, coalition, in co coalition with the mass movements in the streets coming from the from the provinces from Sidi Bouzid from the from you know from the protest movement and building on things like the uprising in Gafsa in the mining area and again 2008 
um, which was very brutally suppressed. That forces its way up through to the very top of the UGTT and forces the leadership to break with Ben Ali. And you can see it coming in the last week. They call regional, firstly, they force through you know, regional level general strikes. And eventually, by the, by the last day, they force the call, they actually call a general strike. And, and that cracks the, uh, you, know, you, go, you know, literally, it's kind of going from Sidi Bouzid and ends up to Fax and then Tunis and bang. And that's very different to Egypt. In Egypt, the trade union, the official trade union structure, which is an arm of the state, um, monolithic thing, gets ch it, it doesn't break with the regime at all. Um, and in fact, is the main organisational force, you know, one of the main organisational forces putting together thugs on camels to go and attack people in Tahrir. Um, and you know, mobilising and mobilising directly, mobilising counter-revolutionary counter -revolutionary forces. But equally, you've had this huge process of worker strikes, and you have the beginnings of independent unions, which is extremely important. So you have had the tax collectors' unions founded out of the big strike in 2007. By two th by the time of the revolution, you have the teachers' union, um, you have the health technicians' union, um, pensioners' union. And the four, those four unions come together in Tahrir Square on the 30th of January to form the core of a new independent union federation, which now has claims a membership of around 1.4 million members. It's very kind of contradictory um, in, in terms of where those, you know, those members come from. There are lots of different levels of, you know, in some cases very small unions, some cases very big unions. But it's it's a real organisation that has brought together quite an important section of the, of the working class and driven into the whole process of workers' organisation, a model of independent union organising, which is actually is very much shaped by the experience of the, of the pre-revolutionary strike wave. So it's, it's very driven from the bottom in, lots of, to, in, a, in a lot of ways by the experience of building strikes without unions, without the official union apparatus, against the official union apparatus, which has some really important effects. It means that, although obviously you have a problem of bureaucracy emerging at the top of these structures, because trade, union, trade unions build bureaucrats who go, want to go and negotiate, who want to go and negotiate with the state, and this is something that, you know, even in the middle of, the revolution, of a revolution this happens, there is a good deal, there is, in the Egyptian case, a much bigger tradition of rank and file organisation to hold, and sometimes quite often overturn, Union, in, independent union leaderships when they try and present things that the rank and file don't like. This happened in the bus strike in Cairo a couple of weeks ago, where um, the independent union, which is, a, which is the, the leaders of, of which uh, you know, played a really important role in organising the strikes against Mubarak, uh, who founded the independent union shortly after that, who built it up from garage by garage across the city, went and negotiated um, a deal to end the strike, went back to the rank and file in the garages and were told to get lost and that and they and the the people who were pushing for the deal uh, got voted out and the people within the leadership who were uh, uh, wanted to continue the strike and were generally with the rank and file bus workers got re-elected you know in, in terms of there, there is there's a real purchase of mass of the, of the kind of mass of striking workers over, in some of the most important of these cases, over union leadership, um, in a way that you, it's, very, it's not part of our experience here for a very long time. Um, now, I'm not saying that that's a general picture everywhere, there are, and there are lots of contradictions, but it's a really important political game for a working class movement that's, in, that's in being built at this point. If there's any, anyone else has any quick points, I just think I want to give Simon five minutes to sum up, because um, I imagine we have to be out of here by, by nine. Before I bring him back, I just want to um, remind people about the next meeting in the series, <coughs> which will be in two weeks' time. Um, Alex Kalinikos is speaking on imperialism past and present, the record in the Middle East, which will be again here. And I also want to highlight to people the... Um, conference that the Men of Solidarity Network is organising. Um, it's a conference for trade union activists and anyone interested in building solidarity with, specific, with the workers' movement in the Middle East. It's on the 20th of November and it's also here in SOAS. Um, if, if you want more details, come and see me afterwards. <laughs>
hands up over to Simon. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with, with Ali on the question, not calling them the Arab revolutions. Because normally I don't. I say it's the global revolution inside the Arab world. But fair enough. But, but there is an aspect of it which is Arab, which is you know, the slogans that emerge out of Tunisia you hear everywhere else. And the way it's, it, it's perceived to a certain extent is that these revolutions also broke out. And, and, and the way people attempt to understand them, and you could really see this when I was in Beirut, was within the old ideological frameworks. So when the Egypt, Tunisian and the Egyptian revolutions broke out, these were actually quite simple. For a lot of people, these fitted, this was simply a correction of the Arab national struggle. So, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was anti-American, therefore it was part of the Arab nationalist struggle and so on. And when it broke out in Syria, then the confusions really started to come through. So, so, so you had, you know, Hassan Nasrallah, you know, praising to, 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 uh, the, 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 the Egyptian people for chanting the people demand the fall of the regime, and then condemning the Syrians for making that, 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 that same demand. And, and, and if you like, there, there is the, the, the very much the limit. You really see the confusion amongst the Arab nationalists and those who still hold um, <coughs> Arab, Arab nationalist ideas in an attempt to understand how you can have a revolutionary process that is, doesn't simply uh, attempt to overthrow the, the, the pro-US or the pro-imperialist regimes, but ones also that are supposed to be anti-imperialist. And I think this is, this, this is causing huge, huge numbers of, uh, huge amounts of, uh, of, 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 of confusion. But also, I think, opening up the possibility for the left. And you can really see the revolutionary left begin to develop its ideas in, in those terms. Um, on the question of the, of the second moon and the Islamists, I just want to come back to this because I think it's important to remember that, it's especially in Egypt, but not just in Egypt, it was furious rows. Pashi brought with the revolutionary socialists and the rest of the left, who had an extraordinarily sectarian and backward idea uh, analysis of the Muslim Brotherhood. And actually, I remember that, that whole period, I'm sure, I'm sure you remember it as well. It was absolutely furious. And to say this is not simply a, a, a den of reaction, that it was contradictory, this is how the contradictions, this is how we can begin to work with it. And I, I, and I think our comrades played a, quite a key, uh, key role in, I think, preparing the ground for the forces that then came in to the revolution. And I don't want to overplay this here, but I have to be careful. But I do, it, 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 it was a continuity of, of, of winning the argument to a certain extent uh, on the left over the question of how you work with the Islamists, but also then um, uh, with the with the Arab nationalists and uh, and so on, and, and it became a, I think quite an important uh, quite, quite an important one. Um, and just on the question of of, of U.S. imperialism, I think we, we have to also bear in mind when we talk about the U.S. imperialism in the 1950s in the Middle East, we have to really think of it in context because the main enemy was France and Britain. They were the ones considered the main enemy. The US wasn't really seen in that kind of way. It wasn't until 1967, to say, when it firmly came on the side of Israel, that then you began to see this kind of hostility towards the US. And so you had, you know, again, Gaddafi, after his coup, you know, didn't touch any of the US companies. Actually, he was trying to encourage more of the US companies to, 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 to come in. It was the marching orders to France and Britain. And it was the same, I think, everywhere else. I'm always reminded of the. The, 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 the large tin my grandmother used to keep on her balcony in, in, in the village, which was uh, an American, had the American flag on it uh, from the 1950s, which was the friendship of the Arab people with the, with the US. You know, it, it was that sense that, in which they, they came in, that they weren't colonial, that it was actually, they used the rhetoric of anti-colonialism a lot and so forth, uh, and, and so on. It, it wasn't really until the defeat, if you like, of, of, of France and Britain, then you get the US really, really, really coming in. And so this then comes to the question of Palestine and Israel, because it is, if, if you like, the question of imperialism is posed as the question of Palestine. Mm -hmm. And how you, how you take on the question of Palestine is wider, and how you take on the, the question of imperialism. So I was saying is one of the pillars, the rhetorics of the regime was, was based around that we will, uh, that, that, that the deal with the Americans was that there'll be a two-state solution. This is something they could sell back home. This was like all the repression that you, that you had uh, to, to, to stop the repression of the Palestinians, the, the state, and so on. All these questions came to that at some point there was going to be this deal that the Americans would deliver, the Israelis would deliver, and they didn't. And I remember because I was in Beirut at the time when this thing came to, you know, the, 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 the Saudi prince uh, proposed it as the final solution, 67 borders, all this, all this elements, and it was just turned down. And you could feel the collapse. You could feel the collapse of the rhetoric. 
that this no longer held anymore. And so then it, it becomes, well, what was, how do you deal with Palestine? What was the question of how you, how, how you, how you dealt with it without taking on imperialism? So, 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 so if you like, this, the ball, you can see the ball rolling away from the Arab nationalists rhetoric towards the Islamists. It was an easy, easy one to pick up. But again, what was the, uh, uh, how, the how, again, you see more of the rhetoric. I mean, I think you see it quite a lot in Iran, the kind of rhetoric that, 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 that the Arab nationalists gave us. So that the whole Palestinian question then becomes, um, the, the, the question of imperialism. But I think it's quite, you know, it's actually tied much closer. I'll always remember that after the, there was a breakout of the Gaza Strip, I can't remember which year it was, I think it was 2006, where Hamas essentially cut the, you know, blew up the walls and thousands of Palestinians went on a huge shopping spree into, in, 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 into Egypt. And then it threatened to happen again at the same time as the Mahalla strikes were, were taking place. And that, that you could look at the, the footage of Mahalla and it looked like Gaza. And the footage of Gaza looked like Mahalla. And people were making the connections. And these political connections were quite clear. Obviously, they're crystal clear in Egypt because it's US supported regime, US supported regime. So it's actually much, 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 much clearer. But you saw it as well in Syria the way in which, uh, right after the, the, the fall of Mubarak, there was that mass uh, uh, trespassing, let's put it that way, from Syria into. Into, uh, into, in, 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 into Israel. And what was interesting about it was the, the backlash that took place inside of Syria after this. Because from inside the Palestinian camps, this was seen as an attempt by the Syrian regime to cover its tracks mm -hmm. over it, and they became actually really sharp. It actually turned into an uprising in, 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 in one of the camps with a popular front general command, I believe that's, yeah. the, that's the one, turned their guns on the Palestinians. Because actually what the Palestinians there were saying was, you can't use, we're not going to allow you to use this question to cover your tracks and what you're doing with, with the Palestinians. So suddenly the question of the Palestinians inside of, uh, inside of Syria is one hostility against the regime, despite the rhetoric and all, all the stuff of the, the regime. Uh, the regime, and it's no surprise, I think Hamas then walked away from Syria. Uh, um, to, to the extent that, at, and the way in which this question is now posed inside of Lebanon, I mean, if you live in the Sovereign Shatila, chances are you hate the Syrians anyway for, for what they did before. But what we're getting is fights taking place on the edges of the camp between Shia supporters of the regime and the Sunni Palestinian, I mean, you know, to put it in those, terms, in those sectarian terms, but that's essentially what's taking place along, uh, along the street, what were quite close allies for a long, long time and are having actually pitched battles constantly over the question, uh, over the question of Syria. So the, the question of Palestine poses you know, the nakedness of the regimes and the naked question of direct imperialism, how, how, how you take on uh, imperialism and so on. I, I think the, 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 the final, um, my final point is this. Which is, oh, I keep saying this. I think everyone probably says it, that we are the beginning of a new, uh, beginning of an era, beginning of, of an epoch in which the first, the, the point to Egypt and what's taking place with the Egyptian working class as as that force beginning to really develop, haltingly, economic, political strikes, the, the way the way it's, it's throwing up its basic organisation of working class, the trade unionism, and understanding there's limits to trade unionism, understanding that it needs to be mass revolutionary party, all these things that we understand. That real questions that, that are rising all the time are rising in a different way amongst the regimes. Because for them, it's like in the process of this revolution, we have no alternative, we seem to have no alternative but to carry on with the neoliberalism and the old policies of before. And so for them, it's not simply a question of, I mean, apart from Libya, where you can simply turn on the taps and flood the area with money. I mean, that, that's true about Libya. But, but, but with the rest of the places like Egypt and so on, is that the ruling class have no solution. They have no solution beyond going with what they were doing before. The only thing they have is to attempt to crush the revolution. That's why I think that the, the, the whole question of their strikes in Egypt are successful and they win promises. At what point are they going to start winning real money that doesn't exist, if you like, inside the system? And so you're getting all, all, all these extreme pressures that are taking place inside the, uh, the, 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 the Arab ruling classes, which is why I, I tend to think you, you can't see a kind of deflected permanent revolution scenario. I mean, I could be wrong about these things. You, you, you don't see that scenario. You see it as much more as an open fight between revolution, counter-revolution, and there being no middle ground anymore. There, there actually being no, no middle ground, um, no middle ground uh, at all. The, the fantastic thing about this 
is, is when you look inside the process, the detail inside the process of revolution that's taking place, that it is fantastic, it is good news after good news, and it is really the development of, um, uh, the d d development of, of, of these forces. But it's not anywhere near there yet. When we go back to the idea of the working class being the social heart and the social head. That is, its demands being the demands of the <coughs> wider society, but also politically how it sees its role uh, uh, in, 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 in the future. I think we can see it either going towards some kind of counter-revolution or towards some, kind, some form of permanent revolution. That's, that's, that's honestly uh, how I see it. I'll leave it there.